Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed your dinner. We're going to get started with the slightly more formal part uh, of this evening's festivities. My name is Michael Colma, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Global Engagement here at the University of Chicago. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming you to, the, to this evening's U.S.-China Forum special event with a focus on energy at the nexus of science, industry, and policy. First, if I may, I'd like to say a few words about the U.S.-China Forum. This is the second year of the program in a series that will take place over the course of the next three years, bringing together renowned experts for high-level engagement focused on issues of importance to both countries and, by extension, the world. It's intended to spur long-term research collaborations between Chinese and University of Chicago researchers. This year's forum is a multi-part event, having gotten started last week with the discussion on the broader U.S.-China relationship, featuring remarks by Ambassador He Yafei, former Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of China, and a conversation that followed with Evan Feigenbaum, the Vice Chairman of the Paulson Institute, as moderated by Rachel Bronson from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. The idea of the U.S.-China Forum builds on a long university tradition of engagement with China that goes back over 100 years. Our faculty features some of the world's leading experts on Chinese traditional medicine, ancient Chinese texts, Chinese politics, and Chinese arts. They're engaged with collaboration in China, working on issues of public health, childhood development, particle accelerators, energy in the environment, and now water. Students participate at the university in a wide range of activities based in China, including language study, civilization abroad programs, research, and internships. Today's event, and the annual U.S.-China Forum is the result of a collaboration between the University of Chicago and the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation. I want to express my deep gratitude to Mr. Tung Chi Hua and the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation for their support and collaboration in this forum. I also want to thank Matt Terrell, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment, and his team, uh, in particular Sharon Fung, Rovana Popov, and Novia Pagong at IME, who have done a tremendous amount of work uh, throughout the course of the previous months in getting us to the forum today. Thanks as well to all those at the university in the Chicagoland area and beyond who have helped to make the forum possible. And of course, finally, thanks to Deb Frodel uh, from GE for joining us on this special night. Now I'd like to just take a minute or two to introduce you to our host for the evening, Matt Terrell. Matt is the Pritzker Director and Dean of the Faculty at IME and the Deputy Lab Director for Science at Argonne. Since becoming IME's founding director in 2011, Matt has led the Institute on a course of rapid growth in the emerging discipline of molecular engineering and with a strong focus on quantum materials, immunoengineering, polymer materials, energy storage, and water resources. Under his leadership, the molecular engineering program has already attracted a, a core of over 15 faculty members, a number that will continue to grow with a thriving graduate program and a new undergraduate major. At Argonne, Matt is responsible for in integrating the laboratory's research and development efforts uh, and science and technology capabilities. He develops and drives strategy to support integrated teams across disciplines in support of Argonne's strategic initiatives. His own research, uh, he's a pioneering researcher in the field of biomolecular engineering and nanotechnology. He specializes in the manipulation and measurement of the surface properties of polymers, materials that consist of long, flexible chain molecules. His work has provided new insights into polymer properties, especially surface phenomena such as adhesion, friction, and biocompatibility, and new materials based on self-assembly of synthetic and bio-inspired materials. Matt began his academic career at the University of Minnesota, moved next to Berkeley, followed by time at the University of California, Santa Barbara, before we got him here to the University of Chicago. He's received many honors, including the Polymer Physics Prize of the American Physical Society, and election to the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I look forward to this evening's remarks and to tomorrow's conference. But now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Matt to the stage. 
Well, thank you, Michael. I, I'd, I'd like to thank the U.S.-China Forum and the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation for making events like this possible, and certainly I want to thank our own staff, uh, Rovana Popoff and Nobia Pagon, Sharon Fong, and, and others who have made this possible. My job tonight is to introduce the main event, which is Deb Frodel. Deb is a 27-year veteran of General Electric and leads the GE Eco Imagination uh, program, which is the company's business strategy to accelerate innovation and growth in a resource-constrained world through efficient and intelligent solutions. That's certainly something that we would like to train engineers at the University of Chicago to be adept at. She's held previous executive marketing and sales and CEO roles in various sectors of GE's business, including GE's capital fleet services, capital public finance, commercial equipment finance, and dealer financial services. In 2010, she was named Chief Strategy Officer for GE Capital Fleet Services and Global Alternative Fuels. Deb is on the board of Advanced Energy Economy, the US DOE Clean Energy Education uh, and Empowerment for Women, MASDARS, uh, Women and Sustainability, Environment and Renewables. Deb, like me, uh, uh, hails from Minnesota, although I, I can't claim to be a native there. Um, she earned her MBA at the University of St. Thomas and a bachelor's degree from Minnesota State University. Please help me in welcoming uh, Deb to the podium. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with all of you tonight, and I promise I will try to keep you awake now that you've had a lovely dinner and conversation. Um, so I wanted just to share with you this evening um, how we at GE, through our eco-imagination strategy, are really working hard on innovation, digital, and partnerships to support our customers, um, to, to help drive change and global impact, um, to have economic and environmental outcomes. So let me just begin um, at the top. Um, you know, GE was founded by Thomas Edison and three of his colleagues back in 1892 with the vision around the electric light bulb and the electric power system. Um, we still have that vision today, and today we operate in 180 countries. And one, uh, we now, our technology powers one third of the world's electricity. It has been an incredible 124 year journey for GE and today we are one of the world's largest infrastructure companies and we have 10 business units that span water, energy, transportation, healthcare and financial services. And over the last few years we've been very much focused on transforming GE into the world's leading digital industrial uh, company where we are marrying up digital software solutions with our world class hardware and driving productivity outcomes for our customers. The transformation um, of modernizing business is an enormous opportunity, and it is estimated that it could generate over $15 trillion of global GDP. GE estimates that the productivity outcomes from the industrial internet could be as much as $8 trillion in the next 10 years. So, you can think about 50 billion connected machines by 2020 and the impact that the industrial internet will have on GE, our customers, and the world is absolutely tremendous. So let me just switch gears a little bit and share with you about the eco-imagination journey and some of our focus areas. So we launched Eco-Imagination back in 2005, when people started to really see that climate science was real, the data was there. Um, not everybody believed at that time, but GE felt a real responsibility and an opportunity that we could help solve some of the tough resource and environmental challenges for our customers. So we launched Eco-Imagination. It has always been part of GE's core business strategy of innovation. We were focusing now on cleaner innovation, driving the outcomes for our customers around economics and the environment, not to have a trade-off. And today, we are now developing cleaner, smarter solutions for our customers. 
and our technology span, the GE portfolio. We have some of the world's most efficient aircraft engines, locomotives, gas turbines, wind turbines, LEDs, water reuse technology, and more. So when we launched uh, back in 2005, we were pioneering a bit. And so what we did is we made big public commitments. We wanted to mobilize all of our stakeholders and be very transparent about the results. So we said we would invest in cleaner R&D and reduce GE's environmental footprint. So since inception of the, of the strategy, we've invested $17 billion in eco-imagination R&D. That's returned the company $232 billion, a proof point that our customers value uh, the outcomes that the solutions are giving them in their business today. And we're not stopping there. Um, we're well on our way to, we committed to $25 billion of cumulative R&D investment by 2020, and we'd further reduce GE's footprint by an incremental 20%, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and freshwater use. So having big goals, mobilizing the stakeholders really validated uh, the strategy. So eco-imagination has always been about meeting real world challenges and helping our customers um, to grow and compete. It's been an incredible journey this last decade, and there's really four areas of our strategy that we focus on today. We um, focus on really first things first is mind share. We look at those emerging trends. We do data and analysis to develop our own corporate strategy, but we also we write white papers, we convene stakeholders to drive action around some of the most challenging issues that we are facing in the world today. We also focus on innovation. We have a huge investment um, that we are pursuing in R&D and innovation. That's inside GE, but we also focus on outside innovation as well. We have a GE Ventures team um, where we are looking for complementary technologies to the GE portfolio. We also do open innovations and hackathons to bring in entrepreneurial thinking and allow us to go faster. The third thing we, we also have in our um, strategic toolkit is industrial partnerships, um, bringing together complementary capabilities with other industry uh, leaders where we can accelerate progress and global impact. And then finally, we work very closely with the 10 GE um, businesses around adopting eco-imagination solutions and making a difference, making sure we're bringing uh, the right technology at the right time in the right market. And so let me just share with you a couple of things that we've been working on recently. Um, you know, the global energy transition has really begun. Today, wherever a power plant is being built in the world, it is likely to be renewable as it is fossil fuel or nuclear. Renewable energy today now accounts for 50% of new electricity additions. And we see that trend continuing to move forward through the end of the decade and beyond. It is because of the commitment to innovation that companies like GE and others have really worked hard to make renewables mainstream today. And another thing through innovation is we've been able to bring down the cost curves, which allows us to drive that adoption and scale the technology. Um, renewables are now much more competitive, and they are also more grid friendly. According to the IEA, the International Energy Agency, between 2010 and 2015, onshore wind generation costs have declined by 30%, and um, PV solar projects have declined by two thirds. Amazing progress has been made on the hardware of the renewable technology. What we're excited about as well is the digital solutions that complement the hardware, where we are able to extract more clean energy output. So we have a new technology solution, our digital wind farm. Sensors and softwares that we can add on to the install base of wind technology today, that over the life we can optimize that wind farm and have up to another 20% of clean energy output, which is generating over $100 million in value for that wind farm, so economic and the environment as well as we need to make our legacy grid much more flexible and adaptable, and we are doing that through uh, software solutions where we can take on more solar, more wind, so we can have cleaner energy um, mix on our grid today. So the water energy nexus, um, another 
uh, challenge that we are all facing into, um, and we are working hard in three different ways. Educating stakeholders around the nexus to drive action, um, looking at new innovative approaches and investing in new technologies, as well as partnering. So all of you know the, the energy, water energy nexus is all about the intersection and the interconnectedness of water and energy together. And this diagram is just a great example. Um, on the top, it's water for energy. You're looking from upstream to downstream. So think about US shale extraction all the way to you know, cooling a power plant. And then on the bottom, it's all about energy to water. Think about sink to source, desalination to wastewater treatment, and all the connection points in between. Earlier this year, we partnered up with the World Resource Institute to write a white paper around the business risks and opportunities of the water energy nexus to really grab mind share and start to educate um, the business community about the challenges that they could be facing. And then also we have innovative approaches and solutions. Um, our water business has our new energy neutral waste wastewater solution. We have a whole portfolio of water reuse um, as well as renewable solutions and we've got demonstrations in the field around using CO2 in the hydraulic fracturing process as well. We also partner up um, on the outside um, doing open innovation challenges. Um, we worked with Saudi Aramco last year um, with a problem statement around reducing the energy cost and energy consumption around seawater desalination in Saudi Arabia. So we went out to the entrepreneur and academic innovator community to help us solve the problem. We had ideas flowing in from 32 different countries, renewable solutions that could combat, um, you know, have a cleaner uh, energy source, but also help us reduce the million barrels of oil that are used every day to power desalination plants. So I know tomorrow's uh, conference is going to obviously yield probably some new collaborations and actions around um, the water energy nexus. So um, I'm looking forward to having those conversations as well. So commercial partnerships, industrial partnerships, last year Ecoimagination announced eight industry uh, partnerships where together working uh, with like-minded companies that are innovation, sustainability focus, problem solvers, um, to really take on the tough resource and environmental challenges that we're facing. We are now focusing on um, uh, reducing water scarcity through uh, scaling water reuse technology, building out solar gas hybrid systems for the developing world, taking energy efficiency to the next level within both operations and supply chains, and looking at industrial internet solutions to reduce waste of water and energy in the manufacturing um, environment. So we hope that we inspire others to join GE in a collaboration to solve some of these tough challenges, but also we would love to see more industry leaders coming together, bringing complementary capabilities to solve some of the challenges around water and energy. So let me just take you real quickly through one of the partnerships to give you a little bit of context of what we're working on. So Ecoimagination and Total are working together on a solar gas hybrid solution for the developing world. Um, the whole goal is to develop an application that is industrial and utility scale so we can obviously reduce cost and emissions. Um, the whole goal is to displace, um, if we could, a portion of the 1,000 gigawatts of um, diesel that is being used every single day in industry. So bringing the complementary capabilities of two businesses together, Total has solar, they have the natural gas, they have the logistics, they operate in 52 of 54 countries in Africa, and GE is bringing the gas engine, system integration, energy storage, commercial capabilities, and together the two of us are working on a new business model, energy as a service, so customers can take advantage upfront of the economic and environmental performance from day one and pay over time. It's very difficult. We are starting in Nigeria. Um, but if we can get this right, it would be profound. Um, so we're excited about that, and we're hoping that our first demo will be at the end of the year. So in closing, I just want to thank you. Um, I'm really excited about the progress we've been able to make on the energy side and the water side in the last decade, and very optimistic about the future. I do believe that innovation, digital, and partnerships are going to help us accelerate that progress, and I think tomorrow will be a great opportunity to build some new partnerships uh, together. So thank you for listening.
And uh, I think Matt and I are going to have a, a, a little Q&A time. So right. thank you. Should, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Here, if you um, will, um, optimistic is the is the word I was going to use to characterize uh, your your presentation, Deb. And I, I I'm a very optimistic guy, so I'm not trying to damp down that optimism. But you know, within the whole spectrum of things that you're involved with, with energy and water, some things are working better than others. What do you think is really the thing you'd point to as the place where progress is being made in the most rapid way or the most effective way? You know, I, I'm most proud of, um, as I mentioned, just that global energy transition, right? I mean, the progress that has been made with renewables and having renewals, renewables be 50% of the new electricity addition is game changing. You think about that, it's happened in the last 10 years. Um, and it's through the commitment of innovation and that investment. And there is still work to be done, right? I mean, we focus um, at GE, we think about three cents a kilowatt hour on wind because we want to get to the point where there are no subsidies any longer. And, and how can we do that? How can we take it to, to the next level? And we are working th on things in the lab you know, to make that happen today, to further bring down those costs, to make it on parity with, with conventional. So I'm super excited about that, um, you know, just the progress that's been made, but really, you know, digital. Digital to me is very right at the heart of what we focus on all the time in eco-imagination, doing more with less, right? How do we extract more clean energy from that installed base through a digital solution versus more hardware being transparent? Uh, you know, transported out there. Well, one key to really successful uh, implementation of renewables seems to me to be batteries and energy storage. Is that something that GE is uh, involved with? We are. We are. Um, we're technology agnostic, so we're not making the batteries themselves. We're sourcing them, but um, the control system um, and the software around that. And we also partner up with um, our ventures team. I mentioned, you know, they do have complementary capabilities into the GE portfolio. We do have investments in both um, STEM, which I'm sure many of you know of, as well as Sonnen Battery. You may know of them as well. Um, they're in Germany today. They're coming to the U.S., very residential focused, but um, very much. Um, and that is a, a huge, huge play in yeah, the future. Yeah. I, I was really uh, impressed and interested by your slide about Africa. Uh, clearly, if, if we look at uh, where the energy demand is going to be growing the rapid, most rapidly, it's going to be in underdeveloped countries. Right. Um, and uh, I, I just wonder how... GE and maybe, you know, um, high-tech Western companies uh, of uh, comparable uh, power to GE, if there are any, mm -hmm. Siemens or something like that, <laughs> so, uh, are positioned to, to move into developing countries as opposed to places that are really ready to mm -hmm. adopt uh, yeah. new technology. Yeah, you know what, I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we operate, GE operates in 180 countries today. We've got a very global footprint. Um, you know, the, the, you saw on the slide, there's still a billion three people without access to energy, right? And they are in developing parts of the world, very difficult parts of the world. Central gen, gen kind of power plants aren't going to be built in those areas. It's going to be very, you know, distributed energy type of solutions. And, um, you know, we're, we're starting to build this out with Total to test it in industry and utility scale, see if we can get this right. But it's a, you know, it is a test. Um, and then can we take that, can we partner and go in other places to start solving um, some of these cha challenges? Um, and, you know, we're, we know that's the future. That is where the growth is going to be, and we need to figure it out. Do you think in, in some ways the implementation of, of new technologies in uh, water are similar to the implementation of new technologies in energy? I, I'm thinking about what you just said about distributed mm -hmm. and, uh, um, you, you know, not uh, huge investments that are very uh, localized. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, clearly we all know how energy and water are coupled, right. but I, that doesn't mean that the solutions to them are the same. And so I'm, I'm wondering about uh, 
how water technology plays out in, in different ways from energy technology? Yeah, you know what, I think they are different, right? Um, you know, water technologies, we have a water business. Um, our chief technology officer from the water business, Tom Stanley, is here. So if you have any technical questions, I will point them <laughs> to Tom. Um, and he's, he'll be with you tomorrow as well. Um, but, you know, I think, um, quite honestly, the difference is, you know, energy, right, you can harness the sun, you can harness the wind, you know, there's a variety of things. There's a lot of places in the world that don't have water, right? Water is a global yeah. and a local issue. And so I think the, the challenges are a little bit different. We were talking at dinner tonight too, right? And there's still water feels like it's a God-given right, it's free. You know, there's all these, these complexities um, with water. So I think the challenges are a little bit different. I mean, there's just as many people without access to clean water as there are without access to clean energy. So we do need to solve and, you know, distributed type solutions I think are going to be very, very important. In some cases, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. I think I'd like to uh, open it up for questions from the floor. Um, yes, please, Bernie. Biggest countries or uh, uh, companies that are the biggest uh, competition for GE in this area? In water? Yes. Yes. I don't want to speak for you, Tom. <laughs> but I mean, you, let, I'll say at the high level, GE water, we focus, the portfolio is half chemical, and then we do have some great uh, water reuse, you know, reverse osmosis, you know, very tough to treat type of solutions, that's the GE kind of water portfolio today. And I think the competition depends on where we are in the world. So I sure don't want to speak for you, Tom. You have much more expertise. <laughs> so maybe very briefly, half of our business is chemicals, and there the, the uh, probably the chief uh, competition is Nalco, which is a, a local company, part of Ecolab. And, and clearly a very uh, distinguished competitor. On the equipment side, it's much more fragmented. Uh, Evoqua, which is the, the new name for the traditional Siemens business, is a big competitor on the equipment side. And then we, we make a lot of products, and then we integrate those products into solutions. There's a lot of integrators out there, like Veolia, for example, that is a, a, is a competitor. So. Um, you sort of have to, there's no direct competitors, so you have to look at different segments, but I think those are sort of the chief ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Other questions or, or comments? We have knowledgeable people in the audience. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Just a, more of a commercial question. So whether you're in the water segment or the energy area, you have uh, projects, I guess, to adopt these technologies. and. I'm curious how you scope those out and decide to implement them, and what what size are there? What size are they? What kind of uh, paybacks do you expect? How many years are you investing for? Those those would be my questions. On, on the water side, I think we're here for water, but I'm, they're both interesting for me. Yeah, yeah, and I think it depends on project by project. Uh, you know, quite honestly, and um, you know, I think what GE is so great at, to be honest, is our ability to commercialize and our ability to scale you know, those technologies. And I can give you just some specifics just relative to um, you know, eco-imagination and some of the partnerships. And then Tom, if you want to you know, add anything else, um, please do. You know, on, on the, on the eco-imagination side, like Total, we also partnered up with MWH Global, uh, one of the world's largest EPCs in Goldman Sachs, um, with the intention of you know, water scarcity is a big challenge. It's a global, local challenge. And the thing is, is that, um, you know, less than 4% of water is being reused today. But we have the technology. So how can we commercially partner? How can we scale on the industrial and the municipal side? And so that's what that partnership is. It's not about R&D. It's really around how can we go around the world, figure out that value proposition for that particular local market, do you need financing or not, for us to scale. Um, you know it can happen because there are countries like Israel and Singapore where those percentages are amazing on reuse. Um, really requires education, right, and probably some regulatory, but the technology is there today for, for us to scale. But, you know, um, it, your, your question was very specific on payback. It really depends on, you know, the project 
um, itself. And I don't, you know, Tom, if you want to add anything to that, please do. Well, just, just maybe on the water specifically, it's kind of a tough industry, you know, yeah. and for some of the yeah. reasons that, that Deb talked about before. And every time we go after a project, it's, it's uh, uh, t always tough competition. There's always people going after the business. Maybe two trends is, or, and, and a couple of things we, we, we think about is, traditionally on the equipment side, it's been more of a cap sale approach, and then it's the return on that, that investment. We're trying to move towards more of a cap sale plus a, an operating margin and, or an operating contract. And the reality is a lot of people you know, want to focus on their core competencies and, and water and, and ma managing their, their water infrastructure is something they, they don't want to do uh, so much anymore. And, and we have the expertise to do that. So then that changes the, the game around the, uh, the economics. So um, I don't know, just a couple of, couple of things and a couple of thoughts around the, the industry. Steve, go ahead. So it seems that a lot of the issues in uh, purification of water, energy efficiency, are also driven by the government. I mean, there are regulations, and and call for new regulations drive innovation in a directed way. A company like yours may or may not like, I guess. But I'm curious if you could comment, one of you, on on that. That is, in a lot of the uh, things that I've come in contact with, for either requirements for water use or water purity. We look at mileage for cars. Mm -hmm. You know, who thought you can get a Honda Accord? I just discovered a hybrid for 49 miles a gallon. Uh, so it's it's. I'm curious the interplay between government, you know, directives sort of by mm -hmm. setting standards with certain timelines and ha how you respond to that. Yeah, you know, it's it's a great question, and GE is always we're always supportive of smart regulation, right? I mean. Um, does it make sense? Are the economics? Is there oversight of that regulation? Um, you know, and we're, let's be honest, GE's in, you saw the industries, we're in highly regulated um, environments. And so we always, you know, welcome that. We're always very conscious to work with customers, you know, in that process as well. Um, difficult to sometimes get ahead of customers and drive things. So we want to be in partnership with them. But as long as it's smart regulation and, you know, there's good, um, there's good opportunity and oversight for that, then I think, you know, um, you know we're supportive. Um, and, and Tom, I don't know if you have anything more to add, but, you know, we do live in a regulated, definitely a regulated world. And some of the issues around water you know, um, there'll probably be more regulation. Well, your comment on, on reuse, mm -hmm. if I can follow up just for a second. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's such a low number. It is such and, a low number. And one wonders uh, what a little bit of government intervention could mm -hmm. do to drive that mm -hmm. much higher. But I guess there's a price point where you, you would know where that works. But, right. But it's, a, it's interesting, I think. Yeah. Nope, you're right. Um, that is... Part of it, right, is it's the education to get people comfortable with water reuse, and then what's the reuse application, community, agriculture, whatever it may be. Um, but you're absolutely right. A, a forcing function of it would be regulation, and you think about that in, you know, where there might be a lack of regulation today. You know, produced water in shale gas. You know, um, but that could change in time. So, want to be working with with customers in that process. Thank you. Sir. Mm -hmm. I think we could have another question if, if there is one. Yeah. Please. Yeah, so, uh, so we have lots of uh, innovations uh, in this country, uh, uh, including in the water area. So what is GE's approach to accelerate the translation of these brilliant ideas into uh, commercial products or processes? So um, I think l let me play this back and make sure I answer your question. So. Like I, I, I said earlier, so we've got the water business. There's a whole innovation pipeline. Tom oversees all of it. We work with our, we have eight global research centers inside GE. We're working with them on, you know, things that we're developing inside. But we also, on the venture side of the house, we do have a whole water team focused at, um, you know, complementary kind of capabilities. And we're working a lot, quite honestly, on the digital elements. Um, are there companies with good digital technologies that we can incorporate into the portfolio as well? There's just such an opportunity 
um, we believe on just the smart water side. You know, there's so much leakage of infrastructure and, and various things that we definitely, yes, there's a hardware side, but there's also a digital side that we can play too. So I think it's a balance of inside and outside innovation um, to really help us solve and accelerate progress. I think a trend over the last 10 years at, at GE was, I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we thought, man, we got all the smartest people in the company and we can answer all the questions. And there's been a real change in the last 10 years where we recognize now there's a lot of smart people on the outside with great ideas. <laughs> and if we can connect to those ideas that align with the strategy where we want to take the business, that's a really smart way to go. And I think the people in the company now feel much more comfortable that you know, we can take those ideas and then we can we can commercialize them. We can make those ideas manufacturable, take the cost out, do the engineering and stuff that's required to uh, create a commercial product. So it's become much more of a, a mainstream uh, uh, operation for us. And we we have people on our R&D staff that uh, spend full time looking for people on the outside, universities, startups, governments, et cetera, where, where there are uh, ideas, concepts, where it may make sense for us to buy or partner and bring that into our portfolio. So it's a very active part of, of how we operate. Well, I'd really like to thank you, Deb, for thank a really wide-ranging and insightful summary of a really important and complex area. And I'd like to thank the audience for attention and questions. And uh, we'll call the evening to a close. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.